Building resiliency, or is it building resiliency? Either way, you are in the right briefing, and thank you for being here today. My name is Ellen Vaughn, and I'm with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and I'm honored to welcome you uh, here today for this uh, briefing on this important topic. EESI, for those of you who don't know, uh, has been bringing science-based expertise and experience on sustainable energy uh, issues to the policymaking process in briefings like this, in issue papers and fact sheets and other educational activities for three decades now as an independent, not-for-profit uh, organization. But we began life as a bicameral, bipartisan caucus, a congressional caucus. Uh, so we thank all of our subscribers and listeners over the years and our donors for making this possible. Also wanted to thank Senator Whitehouse for, and his staff for hosting this briefing today. Uh, we're grateful for that and we're also grateful for the Senator's tireless leadership on uh, climate change and policy solutions. So building resiliency is our focus today and that's because it's a critical piece, we think, to focus on. Buildings uh, in the United States consume 40% of our total energy, uh, including 70% of uh, the electricity produced, and account for about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Most of the energy, most of this energy is to operate buildings. So the monthly costs uh, that go into lighting, heating and cooling, uh, and running appliances and equipment. That's the bulk of these costs. This is not sustainable for the economy, for, uh, for society, or for the environment. It's just bad business practice. But buildings are, are more than what they consume. I think we would all agree. Uh, we invest our life savings to purchase homes. We invest in real estate. And studies have shown we spend about 90% of our time uh, indoors. Uh, so today we're going to look at a number of issues that relate to improving building resiliency and sustainability. Uh, last week, the uh, Homeland Security Committee in, in the Senate uh, held a hearing about the costs of not being prepared for extreme weather events. And one witness representing the insurance, a major global insurance and financial services company said, currently in the United States, many private and publicly held assets from homes to critical infrastructure are not sufficiently resilient to withstand extreme weather events. So today we'll hear from our, our panelists and I am honored to, uh, to, to bring this expert panel to you today, they, they truly are um, uh, immersed uh, in these issues and each with sort of different perspectives. Um, and I know many of you are working on, on policy measures that relate to this. After all the presentations, we'll look forward to your questions and comments and having further discussion. So I first would like to introduce Jake Oster on the far side. Uh, Jake is Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director with Congressman Peter Welch from Vermont. And Jake is pressed for time today, I believe, so I want to um, get off the podium and let him uh, give some remarks, and then we'll, um, we'll move on. Is this on? Can you hear me? This is much more formal than I'm accustomed to. I assume a lot of you in the audience are staffers and are not used to sitting on this side of the dais, as neither am I. Um, so I, Ellen had asked me to come here and provide an update on energy efficiency uh, in commercial buildings, energy efficiency in buildings work that's being done here on the Hill. Um, my boss is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and one of his signature issues that he works a lot of time, a lot on, which means I work a lot on, uh, is energy efficiency. And um, energy efficiency in buildings is a huge part of what we do. Um, Forty percent of our electricity is consumed by energy in buildings, and so uh, it's always considered low-hanging fruit of something that can be dealt with uh, to deal with, you know, whether it's climate change or energy savings or even just lowering the electricity bills um, for, you know, whether it's people in houses or 
you know, commercial um, enterprises and buildings. So uh, there's a wide and broad interest. There's bipartisan support for getting energy efficiency work done. And uh, it's something we've been heavily invested in. Uh, and you will find it brings sort of the cr broad cross-section of interests here in Washington together to deal with how we accomplish saving energy. Um, we work closely with everyone from the Sierra Club and NRDC uh, to the National Association of Manufacturers, the Business Roundtable, and the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, because while saving energy is good for climate change, it also tends to be makes good business sense um, because energy bills are very high for businesses. Um, energy is a major cost uh, for businesses and commercial buildings and especially for folks in the industrial sector. Um, if you're making things, your energy costs are a large part of what you do. Uh, and while there's some debate about how much we invest in energy efficiency and how, you know, how far we go in mandating um, energy efficiency measures, there is general agreement that it makes sense for the federal government to be engaged in promoting and enhancing and studying energy efficiency measures. And there's a real opportunity for doing things there. So I, I think many of you who are following uh, the sort of current state of play on the Hill regarding energy efficiency issues know that Senator Shaheen and Portman are reintroducing legislation today uh, that will um, very much be the marker bill for energy efficiency this Congress uh, that I think there's a real hope to get done. And um, uh, they have baked in sort of 10 other items that were out there uh, that will go in um, that hopefully get them to 60 votes. Um, here in the House, uh, the most recent action has been that the Energy and Commerce Committee passed out with unanimous support uh, the Better Buildings Act that uh, Congress also introduced. Uh, and to give you a quick just tutorial of what that does is there is an issue in commercial buildings, what's known as the split incentive issue. And so um, I, I, how many of you rent apartments in big buildings here in Washington? Show of hands. A few of you. So um, you all probably pay your own electricity bills within your buildings, right? But you don't necessarily control the insulation in your walls uh, or, the inf or the larger structure around your apartment building. So you have a finite amount of what you can control within your space. And your building owner has a control about what, you, what they can do, but they don't, aren't incentivized because they're not paying the electricity bill, right? You pay the electricity bill, but they own the insulation. Um, so there's no incentive for there to upgrade the insulation. There's no incentive for you to upgrade the insulation because you don't own it. So that's what's known as a split incentive. And that same split incentive exists in commercial buildings. And for what we hear from commercial building owners is that sometimes en energy costs can be for energy costs can sometimes be 50% from tenant usage in their buildings. So while they're running the HVAC units and they're running the lighting systems in the hallways and the elevators and things like that, just the usage within their tenant spaces can eat up 50% of their electricity costs. And so they have no control over what goes on in the tenant spaces and the tenants have no control over the larger building. And so the federal government has a terrific program that you've all heard of called Energy Star. And there's Energy Star recognition for commercial buildings, right? You might stop in an Energy Star building on your way home downtown on K Street today. Um, my boss has his uh, district office in a commercial, uh, in an in a Energy Star building in Vermont. Uh, but there's, there's an Energy Star for buildings, but there's no recognition for tenants in tenant spaces. So there's no federal recognition program that says, hey, you built out a really energy efficient tenant space within that commercial building. There's no federal program to say, Congressman Welch's office here in the Energy Star building, that's a great, a great space. You guys did a lot of work. You've met certain specs. We're going to recognize that as being an energy efficient space. And so what the bill will do is it'll study the best way to build out tenant spaces in commercial buildings to meet energy standards, to meet high level energy standards. And then it will designate a voluntary recognition program called Tenant Star to look at those spaces and give them a recognition. So now we'll have a Energy Star for Buildings program and a Tenant Star for Buildings program. And if you bring the two in sync with each other and you start building out energy Tenant Star commercial spaces in Energy Star buildings, you will maximize energy efficiency in those buildings. And you can save a lot of energy. You can invest in great jobs because building out commercial, building out energy efficient spaces creates jobs. It drives technology. And uh, obviously there's the side effect of being good for climate. Um, so uh, that is what the bill will do. We're excited it's coming to the floor next week. We expect um, you know, this may be an opportunity to do more on energy efficiency. Uh, we hope this will open the door to doing more. There's a lot of other bills that are out there uh, that you know, I think are good ideas from other members. My boss is working on bills for residential energy efficiency, industrial energy efficiency, uh, and you know, we hope this will pave the way. So we're excited. We think it's a step in the right direction. Um, you know, building commercial buildings 
to energy efficient specs, building tenant spaces to, to energy efficient specs is all part of building resiliency uh, and developing smarter buildings in, 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 in an age where we have to be conscious of the climate, uh, where we have to be conscious of the cost of our energy bills and uh, in our spaces and where uh, obviously anything we can be doing to help create jobs and building um, architecture and building design are all smart things for policymakers. Jake, thank you. I should mention also that your boss is on a lot of caucuses, is very busy keeping you busy. So the High Performance Building Congressional Caucus, and which he co-chairs with uh, Congressman McKinley from uh, West Virginia, a bipartisan uh, effort. Also the uh, ESPC. Energy, Energy Savings Performance Caucus. Okay. Which is focused on... Uh, performance contracting, uh, mostly in federal spaces. And if, for those of you who aren't familiar with performance contracting, uh, there are contracts the building sign with private sector investors who come in and do energy efficiency retrofits in buildings. So um, say the a Veterans Affairs Hospital in your district um, is old, antiquated, and is sort of wasting a lot of energy. Um, maybe it's time to change all the light bulbs, change out the heating and cooling units, put new insulation in, put in a cool roof, but yet there's not appropriated dollars for Veterans Affairs to do that at that hospital. Well, a company like Honeywell or Johnson Controls or Siemens could come in and say, well, we'll do this project for you, and we'll guarantee 30% energy savings from this project. And from those energy savings, you can slowly pay us back over the course of 15 years. And your energy bill, your, your actual total costs every year won't change for the next 15 years. You'll just pay us back the equivalent of the savings. And at the end of the 15 years, you keep all the savings after that. So it's a way to bring in private sector investment into public spaces, guarantee energy savings, get the work done without additional appropriated dollars. Uh, and it's something that my boss is working on with Congressman Gardner of Colorado. Uh, and it's a real opportunity to also sort of foster private sector development, get more energy efficiency into federal buildings, um, and then, of course, the added benefit of reducing our impact on the climate. Thank you. So uh, really a lot going on. We're very excited by this uh, sort of wealth of uh, efficiency measures that seem to be moving now and, uh, and this bipartisan uh, effort. And uh, so we're crossing our fingers that there will be um, – Something at the at the end of all this. I know you are hopeful for that as well. Um, I know you're pressed for time. Are you taking any questions? I'm happy to take questions. Or? Or yeah, before I run out, I apologize. I'm a little bit uh, scrambling today because we've got the bill on the floor next week. So um, if if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That was easy. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Jake. Thank you so much for coming by, and uh, we'll. We'll be eager to see what happens next week and beyond. And thanks for your efforts. And please thank the congressman for us, too. So our next speaker is Cooper Martin. And Cooper is director of Resilient Communities at the American Institute of Architects. Uh, and I will. Uh, Welcome you, Cooper, and let you talk about what you're working on. Just make sure we've got this. Oh, you're pulling it up for me. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ellen, and, and now that Jake's gone, thanks, Jake, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm here from the American Institute of Architects. We're based in DC at AI National. We also have components all over the country. So wherever your district is, it's likely there's a component in it somewhere. And it's almost certain that there's an architect uh, who is a constituent of yours. We currently have, at the American Institute of Architects, 80,000 plus members. Last I checked, it was about 83,000. We're on the upswing from the downturn. Uh, we count licensed architects as our members, but also aspiring architects, uh, those who have not yet achieved their license, usually aren't licensed until about 35, uh, and several allied professionals as well. You can be you know, associated members of the institute. And we serve as the voice of the architectural profession and the resource for our members in service to society. And it's that last half that I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about today, the service to society, because architects are always trying to find ways to give back. <clears throat> 
The AIA, uh, through, through another department, also issues the Architectural building, Billings Index. This is a leading economic indicator that you guys might find useful, uh, similar to the way the National uh, Association of Home Builders uh, issues their housing starts. Uh, you can track different commercial starts. This is work on the boards for architects. And a score above 50 means that there is more work on the boards than there was at this time last year. A score below 50 means there is less work on the boards than there was this time last year. It's a contracting environment. As you can see, for the last decade, things haven't been particularly rosy. Um, and even now, as we talk about recovery, you can see that we really haven't scratched the blue of that graph very much. It's pretty poor uh, for most of our members. The AIA and emergency management work for decades, architects have volunteered in their communities, providing things like rapid building safety assessments after a disaster in response. They'll volunteer with a local county uh, emergency management office or what, what have you, and just go perform these, these assessments, tag buildings, uh, to really remove that lingering hazard after an event has taken place. You might have thousands of buildings damaged in your community and a limited amount of personnel or time to assess them. Architects are willing to step up and do that. Uh, in the course of that work, though, architects were really only affecting one of the four phases of emergency response, just the, re the response there and not any of the other phases of emergency management. They want to know how they can get more involved in long-term recovery, in mitigation, and in preparedness, and that's where the AIA has kind of evolved our programming over the last several years to become better advocates for the safety and security of the built environment in a more holistic way. So that brings us to resilience and resilient design. The official definition writ large, the entire resilience community is the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, and more successfully adapt to adverse events. Uh, more succinctly, leave it to, to an admiral, uh, resilience is the immune system of our nation. Um, and this, this is kind of the graph that has been uh, canonized into the resilience scripture. Uh, you have the event, you have the downturn or the the impact of that event and resilience is all about how quickly you can regain your functional capacity and what that level of new normal is that you establish after an event in the long term. Do you not bounce back to where you were before or do you bounce back a little bit better and, and bounce back to have an even stronger community and a stronger economy than you did before? So this is all about elevating the practice of architecture and how architects can get involved in all of these issues. The AIA, architects, when we think about resilience, how we apply this lens to our own work, obviously resilience incorporates durability. You have to be able to resist the effect of whatever shock you're anticipating. Uh, but you also have to be more efficient in the way that you utilize resources because if you use fewer resources, then after that shock, you will need fewer resources in order to recover. And of course, we incorporate design. Now, when we say design as architects, we're not just talking about accessorizing a building. We're talking about the actual design process, sitting down and really thinking about how a building is going to function, how flexible it's going to be for your client and for any anticipated future clients down the road in the decades that that building is going to be part of the built environment, um, and thinking about even how that building is decommissioned, how you disassemble that building uh, to, to remove it from the waste stream. Approximately 50% of uh, the waste stream, the solid waste stream in this country is actually building materials. So anything we can do to reduce that reduces our impact on landfills in addition to energy. So why has resilience sort of become this, gr this growing emerging topic over the last couple of years uh, that you probably have heard more and more about? Frankly, it has to do with the, the frequency of natural disasters. More and more, we're, being, uh, we're seeing the impacts of natural disasters on the built environment. Forget climate change. The way we're building our communities, the way we're building our buildings, isn't resilient to the climate and the variability in the climate that we have right now. Uh, so that's a significant threat, a significant risk to businesses, uh, and something that people are more and more cognizant of. Uh, a map that I'm very fond of that I didn't include in this because it's a little bit busy, uh, but you can find it on the Atlantic uh, website, is actually a map of Chicago that compares incidents of flooding and insurance claims from flooding with the actual locations of floodplains. And you'd be surprised to see that most of the incidents of insurance claims for flooding aren't in the floodplain. 
Uh, we don't do a perfect job of managing our floodplains in this country. We could do a lot better, but we do a really, really poor job of managing floods outside of floodplains. The level of concrete, the level of gray infrastructure, uh, and the level of impervious surfaces that we've placed in and around Chicago are actually causing more floods in areas that never were prone to them in the past. Um, and so I encourage you all to look up that and, and just kind of think about that playing out over the course of many communities all over the country, because you can certainly see examples just in DC, uh, where in Bloomingdale, flooding is occurring where it didn't used to before. It's certainly not a floodplain. On a global scale, disaster-related losses are increasing across all regions, finds the UN report on disaster risk reduction. It's threatening the economies of emerging countries and outpacing wealth gains across many of the more affluent nations. So this is why it's becoming a more critical issue. Anytime you're seeing losses that are outpacing your economic gains, that's, that's going to be a red flag. Um, and this has made its way into the business sector as well. Uh, in a talk that I was listening to a couple weeks ago, the, one of the senior VPs from an engineering company, a Fortune 500 engineering company, uh, was talking about the triple bottom line and how maybe a decade, 15 years ago, you would, you would see environmental issues or you would see social issues on a prospectus, but it was kind of one of those things where you'd check the box. And now I can tell you, and he, he frankly tells, tells us, and you know, a fifth, the, the senior VP of a $50 billion organization tells us that those are no longer boxes you simply check. Those issues are as important in the business community as the economic issues. If you're doing a multi-billion dollar project, you would, had better understand how that's going to impact the social welfare of the nation that you're, in, you're, you're doing that work in. Um, and so that's, it, it's something that, that is increasingly well understood. Resilience often gets conflated with sustainability, so I thought I'd take the time to just say, you know, resilience doesn't just exist in a vacuum. You're not resilient to some, some nebulous thing. You're resilient to a quantifiable risk. Uh, and this is another thing that comes from corporate risk management. You can actually calculate what your risk is for a given hazard. You can look at your vulnerability, you can look at your exposure, um, and then the second equation there, you can divide your vulnerability by your resilience or your mitigation efforts. The most simple, uh, analogy for this is, is to imagine a rabbit crossing a road. It crosses the road maybe two times every hour, and on the road there are 10,000 cars that go down every hour. You can calculate exactly what that hazard is, what that risk is, and come to, to a precise uh, number. Um, obviously the hazard, if the car impacts the rabbit, the rabbit's dead, so that's, that value is one. Um, the other values you, you can sort of calculate. But when you actually really get into all of this, you're usually dealing with ranges. So instead of 10,000 cars an hour, it's between five and 15,000 cars an hour. Uh, or the rabbit crosses the road maybe an average of two times every, every hour, but it'll be 1.5 to 2.5. And so you get results that are said to be a little bit fuzzy or have uncertain ranges, but there's still quantities that you can use in your decision-making process. Construction practices today, and this gets into uh, sort of preempting some of the next presentations that you guys are going to hear uh, about different standards that are out there in the world. I want to emphasize that this doesn't come from actual data. All of those little points out there that are meant to be individual building projects, those aren't real life projects that we've, we've assessed or anything, but this is the general state of construction practices today. You can see the model code, the, the building code down there uh, on the x-axis, the energy code kind of over there on the y-axis, uh, different standards, aspirational standards that you can apply that are above code, things like the Fortified Standard, LEED, the International Green Construction Code. Uh, further out, you have Passive House, uh, you have Living Buildings, you have uh, Adaptive or, or even um, what is it, Reconstructive Architecture that you can get into. But the vast majority of the projects that are out there in the world today are not actually meeting those stretch goals, those aspirational targets. Uh, and in fact, a lot of areas where there aren't building codes that are adopted or the building code isn't well enforced, you're getting structures that frankly don't meet either of the codes. They don't meet any of the model codes that we have uh, that are the, the consensus codes that are adopted by our industry. And so that's, that's what we talk about when we talk about elevating the practice. We're not talking about pushing everybody up into the top right of that graph. We're talking about trying to eliminate the bottom left of that graph, the things that just shouldn't be a part of the built environment uh, that are hazards to the community overall 
particularly when you start building more and more and more of them. The fundamental challenge, and this uh, gets to why government has a role in resilience, is that resilient systems are by their nature diverse and redundant. Uh, people who study resilience particularly look at biomimicry, they look at natural systems, they look at the ability of those systems to adapt to stresses, to have redundancies built into them. Um, and comparatively, efficient systems, systems that we usually find engineered uh, in our own society, systems that are economic systems, are very focused and they eliminate redundancy. So you have this tension. And again, this is something that's well understood in business practice. You have greater efficiency over there on the far left of the graph. You have greater resilience over there on the far right of the graph. And there's that window of viability where you have a good balance. Um, now, corporations obviously understand this. Agriculture, it's particularly well understood, even in physical training. If you push yourself too far, uh, if you're trying to produce as many crops as possible, you're stressing the system and you're placing that system at a greater uh, chance of, of more catastrophic collapse. Uh, or in the case of personal training, you're just placing yourself at the greater risk of injury. So this can be applied to a number of different industries. And so the role of government is to try and step in and ensure that a given system doesn't skew too far towards efficiency in the short term, increasing the risk of collapse in the medium to long term. And this is where we get into a couple of recommendations. Now, frankly, uh, most of the policies that are going to impact resilience of the built environment take place at the local level, but there's a lot that the federal government can do to set the table to help communities make good decisions in the long term. One of the things that I'm particularly fond of is reforming infrastructure planning and finance, encouraging the use of scenario development. This is a new, well, relatively new practice in uh, community planning. Uh, where it's a democratic process, it looks at different scenarios over the long term. Uh, you can see an example from Salt Lake City up there. They have an auto-oriented scenario, they have a transit-oriented scenario, not pictured or two scenarios that are kind of in between. And you look at the entire transportation system, but not just the transportation system that you might want to build out, but how that system is going to impact land use, how that system is going to impact air quality, how that system is going to impact average travel times, and then, of course, how much that system is going to cost over the next several decades. Um, and you can put precise amounts uh, of, to each of those values. Uh, in Denver, a cool thing that they did was they actually had little, uh, a little software piece that you could kind of go in and as an individual citizen play with all these different dials and you could rate something as more important or something as less important and see which of the four scenarios that they had created in the, the Denver metro region met your particular values, your particular criteria, and then go to public meetings and advocate for that scenario over the long term. Uh, this is something that you'll, you, you can find if you look up sections 134 and 135 of map 21. Scenario planning is kind of mentioned, but it's certainly not encouraged. Um, and I, as, as you start taking up the highway bill, as it's commonly known, or the transportation bill, as I prefer to call it, um, you can definitely look at different provisions uh, that might change that. Infrastructure banks. We talked about, uh, Jake talked about specifically, uh, inviting in private capital to, to do some of those performance-based retrofits. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure bank proposals that are out there, certainly Senator Kerry's uh, old infrastructure bank bill, had an eligible purpose where you could do retrofits of buildings, not just for energy, but holistic, deep, ener deep retrofits of buildings to increase the resilience, to, in to decrease the water use, to decrease the energy use, to improve the indoor air quality of existing buildings. Um, and so when you think about infrastructure banks, it's not just about terrific regional infrastructure projects of multi-state importance. Uh, there are a lot of small bore uh, eligibility uh, provisions in a lot of those proposals that I would encourage everyone to look at. The Safe Building Codes Incentive Act, which you'll hear probably a little bit more about in the next couple of presentations, uh, would encourage the adoption of statewide building codes, certainly not mandate it, but uh, encourage model building codes, because as I said before, they're really not uh, adopted widely across the country. Uh, this gets, gets back to a little bit more of that on-bill payback stuff too, the, the deep retrofits that Jake mentioned. Uh, but in addition to the bill that he mentioned, PACE is a great, great proposal. Green mortgages, there's so many proposals out there, uh, we couldn't possibly cover them all today. Uh, but they really encourage building stewardship over just ownership. Um, and finally, of course, there's pre-disaster mitigation grant programs, hazard mitigation programs. 
uh, that FEMA offers that aren't really uh, well, well thought of outside of the, or within the, the general infrastructure debate. Uh, lastly, learn from the past disaster. This is actually a report that comes from our AIA New York chapter. It's the work of several hundred architects, engineers, and planners. Uh, and you can find that on the internet. It has a, more recommendations. It's, it's a long report um, that I would encourage everyone to take a look at. So thank you very much, and I uh, look forward to taking some questions at the end. Thank you so much, Cooper. I, I especially appreciated the slide on the different standards and how they relate to uh, codes. And I think that's one thing that can be confusing. There's so many different programs. Um, but one thing that we do like to stress at EESI is the need to both sort of raise the floor and raise the ceiling. So uh, to at least adopt uh, for states to adopt model codes and these model codes as Cooper said, are developed in this national um, consensus process, uh, open process. Um, but then it's up to states to adopt them, and, uh, and that doesn't always happen. Um, and then even after that, local jurisdictions need to enforce them. Um, and there are issues with having adequate resources to do that, so it's a big challenge. But that is something that's available right now that can, can enhance resiliency to some degree. And then um, beyond that, as Cooper said, there are these other uh, measures. And Deborah, our next speaker, will, will talk about um, going beyond code in, in, in these way, in different ways. Um, Deborah Ballin joined the, institute, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety in 2008 as general counsel and senior vice president of public policy. Um, and in this capacity, she's responsible for all legal matters um, for concern, concerning the policy efforts. Prior to IBHS, uh, Deborah was Executive Vice President of Public Policy Management for the American Insurance Association, another AIA, um, in Washington, uh, where she developed and implemented um, uh, federal and state public policy issues. And she was also served on the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, the high-level advisory board on financial management of large-scale catastrophes, um, which includes a heavy emphasis on mitigation measures. Um, so with that and also your degrees from Harvard and Princeton, I think you're very qualified to talk about risk management. And thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was just to make sure everyone was still awake. <laughs> I'm qualified with your help to run the, the little machine here, so, so we're, we're doing good here. But thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, IBHS, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, we are a 501c3 organization uh, supported by the property insurance industry. Uh, and we work to identify through research uh, ways to reduce uh, property losses from natural disasters, uh, as well as more mundane uh, causes of loss. We say if your home is destroyed, it's a disaster, you know, whether it's part of a regional disaster or, or whether it's just your home. You know, so, so we do focus uh, on, on both of those things. And, and equally important, as you can see from sort of things like that video, we focus on communications uh, to try to get people to pay attention, uh, to change their minds, and to begin to demand uh, that we as a society do a better job than we've been doing with respect to, uh, to, with respect to strength and resilience. So we look at the whole uh, building performance chain, um, really like that design element working with the AIA uh, is, as far as that, that, that goes. This is a slide we've had for a while. And as I was preparing for this, I, I looked at um, uh, a report that was done by the World Economic Forum uh, on, uh, on resiliency. and they sort of had this explanation much more complicated, a lot more words and, and, and technical uh, concepts than, than on the slide, but about sort of 
how do you build for resilience? And, and when I realized that they just had all that same stuff. Uh, so, um, you know, you can look at it uh, with a few different colors and, um, uh, and, and, and it's all really got to happen ultimately uh, to get to that point. And we can talk about that a little bit as I'm uh, speaking and then if people have questions about that. Uh, to help us to achieve that goal, uh, we built about four years ago uh, a brand new research center uh, in a little town called uh, Richburg, South Carolina. Um, probably no one has, well, I know you've heard of it because you've been there, Cooper, but uh, uh, the, the, the point of it was that uh, we were far away from any coast because uh, we didn't want our facility to be blown down by a hurricane. Uh, but uh, that said, we didn't anticipate what happens during winter weather in Richburg, South Carolina, when the whole place really shuts down. But, um, but that said, um, uh, but, but also convenient uh, to, uh, to Charlotte, uh, which is a major airport. And we're really trying to bring the world uh, to this research center and better understand uh, vulnerability and how to reduce vulnerability. Uh, and... Um, uh, and, and as well, taking the research center and, and going out, as I said, through these videos and other things. Uh, at the research center, we have a large test chamber, which I'm going to take you into uh, in a moment. Uh, it's capable of uh, wind up to a Category 3 hurricane. Uh, but, but equally important, um, wind is the driver uh, of a lot of the natural catastrophes that we talk about. Wildfire, it's not fire, it's the embers that are brought on by wind. Hail is also part of a windstorm, oftentimes associated with tornado as well. Uh, and rain uh, often is associated with, uh, there's enough uh, uh, wind to, say, take off a roof cover, and then all of a sudden you have, you have issues with the rain. So wind really is uh, the unifying force uh, of an awful lot of weather issues, and therefore a lot of the testing that we did. The first test that we did when we first opened up uh, was wind only. Uh, we looked at two homes. Uh, one was built to uh, the local building code in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, Illinois actually does not have a statewide code. Uh, and then the second home uh, was built to um, uh, a standard that we have developed and we're going to be talking about called Fortified for Safer Living. Someone said State Farm. And yeah, State Farm's in Bloomington. They're one of our, they're our largest member. They had actually built this fortified home, which is why we were able to make this comparison. Uh, the homes, uh, uh, the test was designed to replicate a Midwest style storm. It was not like a coastal storm that we it sort of superimposed on Midwestern style building. It, it was actually replicas of real windstorms that had happened uh, in the Midwest. And you're going to see what happens. The one with the red square was built to the code. Uh, and the one uh, on the right hand side was not. Now that's really not a place you'd want to be uh, during a major windstorm in the house that this blew down. Um, there were, we actually ran this test a few different times. Uh, we had different audiences come in to, to, to watch it. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, and there's our fortified logo. You see, we got smart. Uh, you know that the one with the fortified logo uh, is one of the later tests we did because we realized the video footage looked really good when you had the logo up and you could see that the fortified home uh, withstood all these, 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 these wind things. But we're really here to sort of talk about, uh, Cooper used the term sustainability and resilience. Uh, we started talking about this going green and building strong was sort of the, the phrase uh, that, that we put together. But, but clearly, uh, there's lots of discussion going on about this important uh, topic. Some call it adaptation mitigation. Uh, I've also seen lower environmental impacts and lower the impacts of the environment. Again, all these concepts of, of going green and building strong. And, and it works. Uh, what we're trying to do is make those two things complement each other, work together. Uh, there are some areas where we are concerned sometimes, and I think that was sort of the slide that you referenced, where if you go too far uh, in, the, in the energy efficiency side, uh, we do have some concerns that you may undermine strength. Uh, an easily um, understandable example to people is the concept of the green roof is very good, uh, but if you're in a wildfire prone area and the green roof becomes the fuel source, if it was, I guess it would be a brown roof in, in, in that instance, that is not a good situation. And similarly, some of, some of the work that we're doing, we're testing photovoltaics to make sure that they do not become missiles that destroy buildings. Uh, we're testing uh, some of the insulation to make sure that it is adequate uh, in the face of wind. But these are, as I said, uh, complementary uh, concepts. We were thinking about this. Um, clearly, the, the climate change debate has, has caused this sort of confluence of, of all these people talking uh, in forums like this about all these great things. 
Um, we just sort of started saying, why do you want to go strong? Why is strong related to green? Uh, and so sort of the first thing, we had all these disasters and then all these landfills. And I think you, that was an interesting statistic that you had. I think you said 50% of our landfills is, is building waste. Um, you know, what we say is if it's in a landfill, instead of working, it's not a green building. So um, that was sort of why we first started bringing those things together, even separate and apart from the climate change debate. Uh, similarly, a building that's on fire and you need to use a lot of chemicals to put it out, that's another example of how um, uh, having the strength is certainly consistent with a lot of green concepts, uh, climate change and, and otherwise. We also think about the community benefits of, of both strength and sustainability, and, and I think uh, most people uh, are aware of these issues, keeping communities intact, uh, protecting vulnerable populations, the healthcare system, uh, jobs, and, and post-disaster dollars. I, I sometimes use a slide uh, where we talk about the public policy issues. It sort of has these little levers that work together. And sort of on the one hand are sort of the, the, the concepts that appeal generally to the Republican side, and on the other side are the, the concepts that appeal generally uh, to the Democratic side. Every single one of them is true. And then you sort of bring in sort of long-term health and welfare of communities, and who's against that? Everyone agrees with that, and it certainly is a bipartisan uh, issue to bring us all together. Uh, another thing that we, we tend to focus on is uh, that communities are made of homes and businesses, and so we have done some testing of commercial structures. Uh, and what you're going to see, guess which one is the one that's going to do better, common or stronger? <laughs> all right, I'll show you. <laughs> This was a series of different wind pressures that we put on. You're just seeing the end of it. We had actually cut out the windows on both sides, to be fair. And there was not adequate reinforcement in the common side. And you can see what happens to that, whereas the, uh, the stronger side, that's just actually a little slow-mo version of that. Uh, the, the difference in, in, in the costs on that were about 10 to 1. I think it was about $6,400 versus $64,000 uh, in terms of the costs that were associated with the common uh, versus the stronger building. So again, we try to talk about what are the long-term costs. I'm sure those are you know, issues that you talk about also, uh, you know, whether it's the energy side or whatever. Don't try to save a short-term dollar and, 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 and lose you know, over the long term by, by in this case, uh, not only having your building blow down, but also losing your livelihood you know, if it is your business. I know we're going to be talking a lot, uh, Ryan, about codes. Um, we care deeply uh, about building codes. We, we tend to focus on the IRC and the IBC. Uh, those are the two uh, main safety codes. A um, lot of technical stuff about building codes. Uh, we do have engineers who spend a lot of time on that, but one of the, the projects that we did, and, and we updated it a little bit last year, and we're doing a full update uh, to come out next January, is we did a rating the states report uh, of the uh, coastal states between Texas and Maine to look at three things. One, whether they had a mandatory uh, and modern statewide building code in effect. Two, whether it was enforced. I think you mentioned, uh, Ellen, the importance of enforcement. And three, whether the contractors and the subcontractors that are actually supposed to make sure that that uh, code makes its way into your home are licensed and, uh, and, and disciplined uh, and so forth. And um, you can see that the, the results uh, ranged from a low of four uh, in Mississippi uh, to a high of 95 uh, in Florida and, and Virginia. And what we have found is that there's still a lot of, you talk about a building code to somebody and their eyes sort of glaze over a little bit and you say, you had a four in your state. And then they say, I want to do better. Uh, and in fact, there is legislation right now in Mississippi that has the best chance of passing of any building code bill we've seen in Mississippi uh, that would improve their code, although it is certainly not, not a done deal. Uh, and here you can see the states uh, that, uh, when we look beyond, uh, beyond the coast, and actually Connecticut, which uh, does not do well in this map, uh, has, uh, I think as of tomorrow, uh, will have an updated code. So, so just calling some attention uh, to some of this sometimes is, is, is a good way to get people to focus. We talked about uh, communities a little bit, uh, and here's just a slide from, from Wildfire, which is also important. Uh, and again, it shows how, um, it shows a couple things. And, and one is that, you know, communities are made of homes, and that when communities work together, uh, in this case, to have fire-adapted communities, uh, they really do survive uh, natural disasters uh, much better. And here's another example 
Uh, these are actually our fortified uh, for safer living homes on the Boulevard Peninsula. This was prior to Hurricane Ike. A lot of people laughed at these homes because they were up so high. They called them the bird cages. Uh, and then uh, we found out that uh, Hurricane Ike was going right for this uh, community in uh, I guess we said yay, or maybe we said yikes. Uh, but, uh, but we waited till the wind blew, and then we came back. And, and these actually were the only houses uh, that were standing. There's, um, uh, there's been some pictures of the last house uh, standing uh, in Galveston. Uh, but in fact, uh, that house uh, was so water saturated with mold that that actually had to be taken down. So, uh, but this is not a community either. Uh, and, and, and the point that we make is it's great to have a resilient home. Uh, but if everything around you is gone and the power sources are gone, you're, you're not part of a resilient community. Which gets us to the uh, IBHS uh, fortified standards. Uh, someone mentioned them already. They are code plus. I'm running out of time. Um, but it's a voluntary standard. Uh, we can certainly talk about that further. Uh, and, and the most exciting development on that is that we are partnering with DHS on a pilot program uh, for Resilient Star. Uh, this would be a designation. Uh, it's actually the, the standard at this point is identical uh, to our fortified standard. There are a series of stars, uh, depending on exactly how far up the grade uh, that you go on that. Uh, but uh, I, I loved his comment about the tenant star, um, thinking that, that there'd be interest in that. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to test out with our pilot, is how much interest in that we have fortified. Fortified's been around for a while. But you add to it that sort of government-sponsored resilience. It's the star. Everyone, again, everyone wants to be a star. Uh, and, and that's exactly uh, what we're testing in the pilot uh, and, and hoping uh, that it will be successful and we can really help to scale up the program that way. Another very important piece of legislation uh, that I think Cooper uh, mentioned also uh, is the uh, Safe Building Code Incentive Act. Again, like Resilient Star, not mandatory, but provide incentives, provide a little bit of pizzazz associated with doing the right thing, and, and, and in this case also some financial uh, incentives uh, in the event of a disaster, and we are hoping uh, that uh, the community level and the individual level, uh, we will begin to move. And I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I'd love to, we can, we can talk further about that. There's another piece of legislation I want to mention. I don't have a slide on. Uh, it would uh, 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 reauthorize the NWERP uh, program. Uh, it's the National uh, Windstorm Impact Reduction Program. It's a research program. I think it would provide about $20 million of funding, uh, mostly in the university settings, uh, for uh, windstorm scientific research about windstorms. And I think they are going to mark that up in the Science Committee, hopefully tomorrow, I had heard. Um, so uh, they had a hearing about that last year and, you know, really, again, some very compelling uh, stories that were told about the importance of this research. And again, that ultimately will bring us all to where we need to be uh, in terms of knowing what to do and then finding uh, the capabilities of doing it. Uh, I think pr people are probably are pretty familiar with uh, the President's most recent executive order uh, with respect to adaptation. and, and um, uh, these are actually very consistent with a lot of the things that have been said. Uh, the goals here are not top-down management, but, um, but really providing uh, opportunities and incentives, uh, uh, a lot of times uh, for private sector investment. So I'm out of time and I'm out of slides, which is a really good place to be. Uh, and thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to uh, what Ryan has to say a little bit more deeply uh, about building codes and standards, and then I know we all want to answer your questions. Thank you. Deborah, thank you so much, and especially for those videos. I think we all enjoyed those. They're scary, but entertaining. Um, so um, uh, that was wonderful. Um, I noticed, uh, well, maybe it was Cooper who had a slide about Passive House, and um, I appreciated Deborah's point about being careful we don't go too far. I think one of the things that we'll probably talk about in uh, in Q&A or perhaps Ryan, is looking for these synergies and really being mindful that there are multiple performance goals. And so uh, designing for these, planning and designing for these goals um, are so critical. I was thinking in our house, uh, we live in a 1950s brick house in Virginia, and when it was really cold, it was cold in there. Uh, we don't have insulation. We have done sort of some things to retrofit. And I was thinking if we were in a passive house, 
designed house, we would be toasty warm right now, even if it was cold outside. But you have to think of cost and all those things. So um, our next panelists will talk about um, these and other issues in terms of codes and, and energy and sometimes non-energy benefits of high performance building. Um, Ryan Mears is with the uh, Institute uh, for Market Transformation. Uh, Ryan is code compliance specialist and I am delighted to welcome you to the podium. Good afternoon. So um, I'll try not to put you to sleep talking about building codes as boring as they are. Um, I'm not, not going to dive too deep, but I'm going to take a little bit of a, a little deeper dive than, than Cooper and Deborah did in talking about building codes and the impact that they have on resilience. Uh, but bef uh, before I do that, the Institute for Market Transformation is a, a DC based nonprofit, and we focus on energy efficiency in buildings. And my capacity there is running our work on energy codes. Often energy codes get overlooked when you think about resilience because it, it's kind of misunderstood that they, they it's, it's kind of viewed that they don't have a direct impact on health and life safety. But uh, one impact that they do have is when you have a house that is well insulated and well sealed, uh, when you have a, a power outage or a extreme weather event, you're going to you're going to be able to re, uh, maintain comfort for a much longer period of time in that house compared to uh, to Ellen's. So, <laughs> so I'm going to briefly touch on development and adoption, um, kind of at, at a at a high level, and then I'll dive into enforcement and what role enforcement plays in ensuring that uh, our our homes and businesses are built to current codes, so that the the ba very basic levels of resiliency that are that are kind of baked into all the codes actually get met. I'll talk about some of the barriers and also um, the so, some survey results. So the development of building codes is it's a they're, con they're considered national model codes. It's done on a consensus based process. Uh, the most common is the iCode family, which is um, developed by the International Code Council. And those are done on a three year code cycle. And the ultimate and final vote of what goes into those codes is, is determined by local building officials. So one way to, um, to improve resilience is to begin to incorporate more principles uh, into these codes. So the research that Deborah is doing uh, be very helpful to take those findings and see how they can be implemented into a code. As you can see across the bottom, there's a whole uh, family of codes that address all different um, aspects of construction. So then when it comes to adoption, this is really a state level activity. And there are a few exceptions where uh, local governments are, um, are actually the ones who are adopting codes because uh, as Deborah mentioned, there are some states that do not have a statewide code. So this particular uh, map is actually uh, energy codes, and there's 11 states, uh, the ones in gray on here, that either have no statewide code or they have a code that uh, predates the 2006 energy code. So it's a very outdated energy code. Enforcement comes down to very much a local level activity. This is your cities and counties, um, local building departments. They are reviewing uh, construction documents and they're looking at um, doing on-site inspections to verify compliance. And where the, where the issue of, of education and outreach to, that comes in, as a, a, a quick example here, and New York State has uh, 62 counties, uh, and Orange County, where I grew up, has 44 cities and towns. Most of those cities and towns have some type of building department and they do some type of building code enforcement. When you broaden that out to the US, you're looking at 30,000 uh, jurisdictions that are enforcing or uh, in some way enforcing a building code. So why, why enforcement? Why focus on this? This article here um, about the, uh, the more Oklahoma tornadoes uh, it, this came out just last week, and it's uh, in advance of a report that is going to be put out that's, uh, that reveals that there was um, construction flaws and code violations uh, that cost lives when uh, the two uh, schools uh, basically were destroyed in that tornado. So this is the reason. Consistent enforcement with the codes is crucial to maintaining a very basic level of resilience. 
So you probably ask, well, you know, why? Why isn't this being done? Why can't, why, why aren't building departments out there um, doing this? So, and they are. They, they, they're very much um, under-resourced. And there's, there's also um, a lack of knowledge, but more, more so than a lack of knowledge, there's not a really adequate training infrastructure um, for building officials. So that's, that's really something that is uh, it's critical to improving compliance rates. It's getting, getting education out there to building officials and also to industry. So working with AIA to, um, to educate architects on resilience principles, on the building codes, you know, the, the architects that are designing them, we want, the, we want their designs to be in compliance with the code when they're submitted, and that way the building official, if, even if he misses something, that building has been designed to meet the code. So that the, the building official is really that kind of last level of, of enforcement, whereas we want the industry that's doing the work, doing the designs, doing the construction, we want them to be the ones who are complying with the code. So there's also a lack of political will, and it, working so much with the energy codes, I think that lack of political will definitely um, definitely applies to the energy code more so than the other codes, but it definitely creeps in. Um, oftentimes, uh, elected officials hear how much the, the new codes are going to increase construction costs, and they, uh, they will uh, reduce code requirements, or they will basically tell their building department that they shouldn't be enforcing certain provisions. So uh, politics plays into it as well. And then the last one is just not knowing what compliance issues exist. A lot of building departments don't really have a quality assurance procedure. Um, they don't have, they, they haven't really done an assessment to see how well, they're, how well they're enforcing the code. So they don't really know what that baseline is to know how well they're doing and where they need to improve. And uh, a, a couple of years ago, IMT did a study that found that for energy codes, to improve compliance with energy codes, $810 million was needed uh, nationally on an annual basis uh, to bring compliance rates up to 90% or better. Uh, that was based on some best practice jurisdictions who were providing specific resources for uh, energy code enforcement and then scaling that model up uh, across the U.S. So the, the good news is, is that there's many ways to improve energy code compliance that don't involve just throwing money at it. You can improve efficiencies within building departments, uh, many of which are operating you know, the, the same way they did in the, the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, you know, with a lack of resources, it's difficult for them to um, take advantage of the newest technologies and faster ways of doing plan review and inspections. So you know, education is, is definitely critical in getting training to, to building officials. So I'll, I want to round out my presentation with uh, some results from a, uh, the Build Strong Coalition did a survey of 44 um, insurance and disaster response uh, professionals, industry and government professionals, and had some, uh, some very interesting findings. So the first question was about the, um, what's the most significant barrier to improving a community's disaster resilience? And you'll see um, here about 36% said a lack of comprehensive and enforced codes and standards. But not far behind, it was a lack of understanding within the community of the actual cost of the disasters. And I, I think that these two are actually very related. Um, without an understanding and a, a, an outreach on what the cost of a disaster would be within your community, there's kind of a, there's a lack of real urgency in getting a really good and enforced code. So again, the need for education and, and resources for better enforcement is, is critical to uh, improving resilience. And then the, the second question, what are the barriers you see to code adoption and enforcement? And then 63% said a fear of increased building costs. And then 38% an unclear cost benefit information. Again, these two are very related. You know, not having a clear understanding of the cost and benefit Means, means you say, why am I going to pay for it? Why am I going to pay for, uh, for a better coat, for a better building, when I really don't know what the benefit is to me? And then uh, return on investment. So what strategy that has a return on investment could be implemented in order to, uh, to improve hazard mitigation? And this one was actually pretty clear. 82% said building codes and regulations that actively reflect local risk and mitigation 
uh, measures that also address those risks. So what we're talking about is there's a need for, uh, for, local, for local action. There's a need for, um, to reflect local risks within, uh, within communities because you know, resilience is very much something that's done at the local level, but at the, at the national level and at, at state levels, it's where you really need to um, improve the education and the resources that get down so that the local jurisdictions have what they need to make the decisions. So um, brief conclusions. Building codes can definitely improve resilience. They, bring, they, they raise the floor and they, they offer, they're, they're ready-made, they're out there now. Um, getting states to adopt the current codes is really critical so that they have the most advanced codes that offer the most resilience. Uh, but also uh, local and regional specific strategies are important. And then a better understanding of what the cost-benefit analysis is when it comes to um, mitigation uh, options. Education and outreach and then definitely improved compliance because even if you've adopted the current code, if your compliance, if your enforcement infrastructure is poor, it's, it's not gonna get, the, the requirements of the code are often not gonna get met. So over the last several years, my work is focused on energy codes and I feel that there's a lot of lessons that we've learned in improving energy codes over the last 10 years that definitely apply to uh, resilience, improving resiliency as well. So things like coordinated efforts on development and adoption, bringing together broad coalitions to develop uh, energy efficiency standards and improve codes, the, the energy codes themselves, uh, was very crucial to, to, um, to being effective in improving um, the energy efficiency of energy codes. And then having some consistent methodology to, to do the cost-benefit analysis. Um, that was very critical in, in being able to evaluate what proposals um, would save the most energy and what the payback on that would be. So, and then financing mechanisms. You talk about existing buildings, a huge issue um, on energy, but also gonna be a huge issue on resilience. You, we need to be able to improve our existing building stock, both, it's, both the energy efficiency of it and the resilience of it, and financing mechanisms to do that are, are a critical way uh, to, to improving existing building infrastructure. And then voluntary programs, uh, like Deborah mentioned, that, that really pull the market forward. They get new technologies out there, they get these things tested, and those best practices feed back into the code eventually and raise the floor and bring it, bring it to, you know, to market scale. And uh, direct engagement with cities. We've really found that you've got to, to, when it comes to in, uh, improving compliance with energy codes and with building codes, you've got to go to the source, and that is directly working with cities and counties to help them understand what, their, what the issues are um, with compliance within their jurisdiction and then how they can improve them. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. That was, that was terrific. Uh, and I think all of these uh, different aspects show both uh, how big this issue is, but also how many uh, uh, smart people are working on it and how many good initiatives are underway to um, to make some inroads. So th I thank the panel for, for your presentations and for the work that you're doing. Um, and I want to open it up for, qu for questions from you uh, and your comments and further discussion at this time for any of the panelists. Fred? Uh, Ryan, can you give us a specific example? of a cost-benefit um, analysis that demonstrates the value of either resilience-oriented or energy-oriented codes? Um, for, for, from an energy code perspective, um, to, uh, so the, the, the Department of Energy developed a, um, a criteria for, for doing cost-benefit analysis. Um, and the, it, it is, in the case of energy codes, it's, it's through energy code modeling to see um, what to, to really compare different measures, uh, different levels of insulation, um, how much energy they're gonna use you know, with uh, an R15 insulation compared to an R21 or something like that. And then how long would it take uh, the, the, a homeowner to recoup that investment 
um, on the you know after they've uh, they occupy the home. So what the energy savings would be from instituting that measure. A question also for Ryan. Um, with, with regards to uniform building codes, uh, when they get local, uh, to, how, to what extent are adopted codes reflective of the particular risks uh, in those states where, where they're adopted or in those municipalities or counties where they're, they're, uh, they're endorsed? Uh, the reason I'm asking is, for example, um, San Diego, you might be particularly concerned about a fire risk, maybe flood to some extent. Uh, Florida, heaven knows, you know. Um, Carl Heisen has had some fun over time talking about the, uh, the rigor of, of, of building code and compliance in, in Florida. Uh, made quite a joke of it. But I understand that's gotten better. They get a 95, right? So um, I, the, the question is, is, is how flexible is that? Uh, is that a problem? Is that, uh, is that a level of, of investment for those localities or states uh, that is just beyond their capability? As I explained, one of the reasons why some of the states aren't adopting codes. Yeah, it's a it's a good point you raised. So the as I mentioned early on in the on, on my slide on development, um, the International Code Council develops the I Code family of codes, um, and there are there are codes within there that if you were in San Diego and concerned about fire, you would adopt um, certain code as as opposed to others. But in, when it comes to the state level uh, of adoption, the the revisions to the code vary. Um, some states will uh, will just tear it apart and basically put their own name on it um, to, to, so that it reflects the construction practices within that state. Um, having come from running the adoption process for the state of Georgia, um, very familiar with how, they, how codes can get, um, the, the codes at the national level are often not reflective of regional construction practices. So frequently they will be revised at the state level. And then sometimes local jurisdictions will, uh, will decide that they want, that certain provisions do not meet their needs, and so they'll change things at the local level. If I could comment on that from an IBHS perspective, we support mandatory statewide codes uh, and do not uh, have, have real concerns about local jurisdictions coming in and, and, you know, you could, I guess we could say you could strengthen them, but don't weaken them because oftentimes it's a political process. That said, um, certainly in, in the case of wind, uh, which is uh, where a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of the attention has, has gone and a lot of the money uh, goes, is that superimposed on the statewide building code are um, engineering maps uh, that, uh, that tell you what the likely wind speeds are. And there are certain requirements, you know, in coastal areas where you're in a higher wind speed area, um, uh, the, the, the model codes themselves do impose, in some cases, additional strength requirements. Uh, you know, we had an issue in, uh, in Maryland last year, and Garrett County is not going to have the same wind requirements that Ocean City, Maryland uh, would have. Another issue that comes up are, is agricultural buildings, and, you know, depending on the tenor of a state, uh, there have been concerns about applying uh, building code standards to agricultural buildings. Some states have exempted those at the statewide level. Um, but, but the big thing, I think, um, you know, is, is wind speed. Um, with respect to wildfire, I believe California is the only state in the country that actually has a wildfire code. So um, uh, that's not an issue, you know, other places, although, you know, wildfire risk does exist, I think, in 38 states, and more states should, absolutely. Uh, but at this point in time, um, that's more of a theoretical discussion than a real one. Yes. David? Yeah, hi. Um, you, you all, to, to some degree, talked a bit about um, education and the need for, for better education going forward. Um, I was wondering if any of you had ideas for, for actual concrete uh, measures to, Im to improve education, especially since a lot of this is happening at the local level. That can be like, logistically challenging. Um, so me measures for improving education of, of I guess, the, the population and as well building officers and some of the, the agencies, I guess, and people like that. Want to take that first? Yeah, uh, I can start. Um, from our perspective at the American Institute of Architects, just being a member requires you to obtain a certain number of uh, continuing education credits to maintain your membership, and, and most states require it to maintain your license. Um, so we have what are called health, safety, and welfare courses uh, that are offered by providers all over the country. Uh, right now, we're working on devising a curriculum that's going to be specifically for architects 
uh, that'll sort of include 101, 201, 301 levels of resilient design information. There's also a lot of stuff that's already out there that we just need to collect. Uh, for instance, the National uh, Disaster Preparedness and Training Center out of the University of Hawaii at Manoa has a new course that's just coming online called Hurriplan, uh, which is hurricane resilient design. Uh, it's intended for architects, particularly architects who work in the public sector, who work with cities, who work with counties. Uh, and we're working on pushing that out around the country through our, our component network. Uh, beyond that, we work with a lot of organizations that are basically public information campaigns. FLASH, the Federal Alliance for, State, uh, for Safe Homes, um, IBHS does have a, a considerable amount of public outreach. Uh, the insurance industry is always trying to reach their clients and customers with a little bit more information. Um, and architects help provide that. So there's a lot of different things that we try to do. Obviously, there's, there's always more that we would like to be able to do, uh, particularly for the construction industry, uh, because we, we hear from a, a lot from practitioners, you know, guys who are out there doing the in insulation installation, guys who are out there doing the roof installation. Their crews are working six or seven days a week, and they refuse to take free training that's being offered to them. Um, I, I recently heard an instance of this happening in Minnesota where the uh, uh, manufacturer had been trying to offer free training for nine months mm -hmm. to someone who was installing their product, and they couldn't get a day to just train their staff on how to actually use this product. They don't know if it's being installed correctly. Um, and so that's a huge challenge uh, within the construction industry at large is, is the appropriate installation of the designs that are made by architects. Yeah, I agree with all those things. Our focus is, as Cooper indicated, is more on public education. You know, we have a website uh, that's got all sorts of information by peril uh, for homeowners and for small businesses. That, of course, requires you to go into the website. So uh, like other organizations, we're trying to uh, use social media uh, more and more uh, to try to really put out uh, lots of short messages on, um, you know, things that uh, that your average person can do to, to become, uh, make their home stronger, whether that's a longer-term issue. Uh, we have a publication, for example, called Roofing the Right Way that's intended at the time of re-roofing, if we can get that out to people. And one of our vehicles for getting it out to people actually is insurance claims um, you know, claims examiners, because um, the insurance industry is actually the largest consumer of roofs in this country, uh, indirectly, uh, through claims uh, of roofs that have been destroyed or homes that have been destroyed because the roof has failed. Um, so, so, so we are trying to get that information out. The, it is a challenge to work with the roofing industry. As Cooper said, we, we have a number of outreach programs uh, with them. And um, one of them that, that could yield some fruit, although people have to pay attention to it, is a partnership or we're a member of um, an organization called RICAWI, that's the Roofing Industry Committee on Weather Issues, I think it stands for. Um, and through that group, they are putting together a series of best practices guides for different types of roofing uh, materials. Um, so again, if you can sort of get those filtered down through those sectors to their members, uh, that will help. But but it, it, I'll tell you, it is a challenge. I, I got a new roof about a year ago, and um, had my roofing the right way brochure out and told the, the roofer all the things I wanted. And, and of course, he looked at me uh, right through the husband and said, little lady, you don't need that stuff. Don't believe everything you read on the Internet. Uh, so um, it's a challenge. Little did they know what they were, who they were talking to. No, they didn't. And, and that roofer was not selected. <laughs> Ryan, did you want to add? Anything on there? Um, just briefly on that, to, to build on something that, uh, that Cooper mentioned about training the trades, uh, we've, we're finding that bilingual training is actually a, a very needed resource to, uh, to build up um, our trades so that they can, they can really understand um, you know, how things are supposed to be installed properly. Um, I, that's all I'll say on training. Well, I just think that obviously that's a very good question. So we have the technical training, and then you have public education so critical. There's there's a lot going on, but there's so much more that we need to do. I would just add to that that um, the Department of Energy has a building energy codes program, and uh, you know we all try to figure out well what's the state lo role, what's the local, what's the federal. That is a, a federal uh, a issue because it is is something that is um, proposed in the in the budget and. Um, you know, goes through the appropriations process, and that um, the panel 
can uh, provide details if you're interested, but the, you know, that is to help in this whole co-development process to provide um, the modeling and to make sure that the codes are developed to actually save energy. I'm talking about the energy codes, obviously, but then also to help um, with training uh, to, some de to some degree. So that's, that's critical. Yeah, I, I would I would build onto that a little bit. The uh, the Building Energy Codes program at the Department of Energy has done a great job of developing uh, materials uh, based on the national model co model energy codes, uh, the International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, they have a, a site called Building Energy Codes University where they put provide all these training materials. Um, what's really lacking is that is that last step in getting someone to take those materials, uh, adapt it to uh, a state code or local code, and get a training out there um, to, to, to be able to reach code officials and, and professionals and trades. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question for Ryan. Uh, actually, two questions. Uh, you talked about the importance of enforcement and the fact that local governments are financially constrained more and more. There is a growing trend uh, in the United States and actually in the world of third party code enforcement and I'm wondering if you could comment on that. And my second question has to do with the fact that most of the codes address new construction which is probably about two to three percent of the buildings out there. And you mentioned existing buildings on one of your slides, but it was not in connection with codes. It was in connection with incentives. Could you say a few words on how the codes address existing buildings? So on the, on the first question of third-party enforcement, um, I've written actually several case studies on utilizing third parties. Um, there's various ways to utilize third parties when it comes to enforcing um, building codes. And uh, one of them is, is to use third parties where, where building departments don't have the resources to do things. So it, when it comes to the energy code, it's things like uh, building envelope leakage testing and duct leakage testing, um, very specialized uh, test procedures that building departments just don't have the resources to go do. Um, they can take several hours. So uh, basically approving a third party so that a builder can just contract with them as, as, the, as someone who's approved by the building department to perform those tests and then do them and report back on it, on their findings, uh, is one way to use third parties. There's other ways, there are, there are entire companies that will come in um, and the, the local government will just contract with them and they will run the operations of the building department. And they have um, very high standards generally for um, their employees, for continuing education. And so they tend to do a very good job of enforcement. But they also, because they're larger companies, they can shift resources from if, if they have um, you know, contracts with several jurisdictions. And as building volumes and permit, uh, permit volumes change, they can shift resources around to where they need them. Um, and they're not constrained to, uh, to just one jurisdiction. So I think that's on the third party enforcement. All those case studies are on, the, on our website, imt.org. Um, for existing buildings, uh, you make a good point, and there is an existing building code. One of the international codes is called the International Existing Building Code. Um, there's also provisions within the International Building Code um, that address existing buildings, uh, Chapter 34. And the, in, in terms of the energy codes application to existing buildings, there was actually just, a, a, when you talk about code development, there was a um, a successful uh, proposal that was adopted just this last cycle that will be included in the 2015 codes um, that will basically add a new chapter that specifically looks at how the energy code applies to existing buildings. Uh, it's a very important issue and getting the codes to acknowledge them is one thing. But then you have to also recognize that there's, at the local level, there's permitting structures where you, if you don't, if the jurisdiction doesn't require a permit for say a roof replacement, then there, what what what, what um, mechanism do they have for enforcing the code on that? They didn't didn't require a permit to do it anyway, so that's. That, thank you, and that's that's another critical issue. I think uh, there are so many um, related issues that would be important to cover in subsequent briefings, uh, in, such as financing, and and I think all of you mentioned it or, or showed it in slides and. Um, EESI has done some work on utility on bill financing. You've mentioned PACE, green mortgages. Um, you know, our, our institutions 
our housing policies, many of these things are just not, uh, not designed to, to recognize and to take into account and to encourage better uh, performance, better quality uh, buildings and, um, at, you know, and looking at that cost of ownership. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, any other questions? I, I also wanted to, if I may, just put a couple points out in case the panel um, wanted to uh, address those, and that is schools. I know um, we all care about schools, and uh, it's, it's an important building type for all the obvious reasons, but another one is uh, that schools are often places of refuge for a community in times of disaster. And, um, and I think there's a lot of uh, reason to be looking um, at school buildings uh, for, for higher levels of performance, um, not only to improve the learning environment um, for, for kids in a better um, environment for teaching, but uh, if, you, if you do have uh, you know, sort of this last place of refuge, um, what a great idea to, to make sure that it has, for example, um, renewable energy systems that can continue uh, keep the building functional during a power outage, that it can continue to um, purify water systems or whatever it might be. So that's, that's an important thing as well. And, and hospitals. And hospitals. Healthcare. Hospitals and healthcare. Exactly. Did you Cooper, want us to comment on that? If you would like to, you are <laughs> yeah. absolutely welcome to. Um, yeah, I, in my presentation, I talked a lot about just generic buildings, buildings writ large, but certainly public facilities, schools, hospitals, uh, any government building, whether it's a VA th building, a city hall, I think all of those, and, and I think that I can safely say that this is the position of the Institute, all of those should meet higher minimum codes than a typical building. Um, in any disaster situation, if you can't send kids back to school, then nobody's going back to work. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually one of the pr primary problems uh, post-earthquake in Haiti, is that no one had anywhere to, to send the kids uh, back to schools, and so it delayed by months the recovery that otherwise could have been taking place on top of any number of other problems you choose to, to list. Um, so certainly being able to shelter in place in schools, being able to use those schools as places of refuge. In Hurricane Sandy, I know that there were schools in Connecticut that people sought out that weren't places of refuge. They were never intended to be places of refuge. People went there anyway uh, because you just assume as a member of the community that that's going to be some place that you can go. Um, and now the mayor had to, to take a look at that and take a look at the entire school district uh, on how to retrofit those schools to potentially serve as places of refuge in the future. Again, this is a cost that could have been absorbed during the initial construction phase, and now you have to retrofit an entire suite of buildings just to get it up to where uh, we would argue that it should have been in the first place. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess I would leave you all with this one thought, and that is, uh, again, someone mentioned this, um, you know, it's what society codes and uh, the way we build our buildings, design and build our buildings. Uh, in, in some ways, it's reflective of what we uh, expect and demand as a society. Another reason why education is so critical, public education, Consumers Union did a survey a couple of years ago um, and uh, found an overwhelming majority of, of respondents um, just assumed that their homes met the latest code, which isn't always the case, as we've learned. Um, and they absolutely wanted that because they felt that that would be um, cost effective over the long term. So again, some of those financing issues to, to start to recognize um, co investment versus cost. You know, how do you, uh, how do you prepare and, and save money over the long term? And, and I think um, looking at the multiple benefits of better buildings uh, and how those, uh, you know, what we really need a better way of, of doing this cost-benefit analysis and um, some things we just don't 
factor in right now. We don't factor in the cost of pollution, the fact, the, the cost of uh, uh, cleaning up landfills, the cost of um, uh, not being prepared for disasters, and I'm, I think we're starting to do that, um, obviously. And we have so many other issues to cover, the electric grid, the uh, other aspects of communities, and we're hopeful that we can uh, tackle some of these other issues as well on resilience and sustainability. Uh, so I want to thank the panel very much uh, for your presentations and all of you for being here and your good questions. And uh, I think our uh, materials will be posted on our website in the near future. And I um, uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much.